Welcome back to Your Truth. If you tuned into our previous segments, then you already know how many of your tax dollars are being spent on the war and how much influence defense corporations have in the shaping of our foreign policy. Many people thought that the end of the George W. Bush administration meant the end of corruption and scandal in American politics. 2008 was looked forward to as the year for change, with Barack Hussein Obama emerging as the leading peace candidate in the Democratic Party. So now that he's in office, what steps has he taken to end the war on terror? The biggest change made thus far has been a name change. President Obama has substituted the term war on terror with overseas contingency operations. So why would Obama do this? We asked the opinions of some students at San Diego State University. It's kind of frightening, actually, this phrase, overseas contingency plan. Um, I'm scared of that more than I am the war on terror. Because the war on terror is at least, um, on the surface, is trying to tell you what it's about. An overseas contingency plan is, it's doublespeak, it's Orwellian. Well, maybe he's trying to make it seem like it's not a war anymore. That we're just doing things overseas to, instead of it actually being a war, but I think it's still the same. Um, it can change like an outlook, just in the fact that it makes it seem like it's gonna be over soon. I think he kind of just sugar-coated it to make it sound better than it actually is. Well, it seems like a lot of students aren't fooled by this PR strategy and can see that changing the name to the war certainly doesn't mean an end to it. In this segment, we'll be taking a look at where we are now and what people all over the world are doing to be the change and to end the war. So where are we now? Well, on the campaign trail, President Obama promised an immediate timetable for the withdrawal of our troops in Iraq. To ensure that we are not continuing to try to impose a military solution on what is essentially a political problem in Iraq. And that's why I put forward a bill that would begin a phased redeployment and have all our troops out by March 31st of next year. Your question was, could I guarantee all troops would be out of Iraq? I have been very specific in saying that we will not have permanent bases there. I will end the war as we understand it in combat missions. However, once he became president, the rhetoric changed. By August 31st, 2010, our combat mission in Iraq will end. After we remove our combat brigades, our mission will change from combat to supporting the Iraqi government and its security forces as they take the absolute lead in securing their country. Initially, this force will likely be made up of 35,000 to 50,000 U.S. troops. On March 27, 2009, Obama outlined a renewed effort to fight terrorism in the Middle East. Now, I have no illusion that this will be easy. In Iraq, we had success in reaching out to former adversaries to isolate and target al-Qaeda in Iraq. We must pursue a similar process in Afghanistan while understanding that it is a very different country. There is an uncompromising core of the Taliban. They must be met with force. And now we face more unsettling news with regard to Afghanistan. President Obama has announced that we must refocus our efforts back to Afghanistan in order to help train the Afghan army against the Taliban. He proposes to send an additional 21,000 troops into the region. On May 5, 2009, CNN posted an interview with an Afghan Taliban spokesperson who promised that Afghanistan will be Obama's Vietnam. Two days later, Ross Story reported that the cost of fighting the war in Afghanistan will overtake that of the Iraq conflict for the first time in 2010. The same day, the media reported that a sprawling 440-acre U.S. military base is being constructed in the middle of the Afghan desert to accommodate the increased troop presence there. But that's not all. Since Obama took office, we've been sending drone planes into Pakistan, bombing villages and killing hundreds of innocent people in an attempt to fight al-Qaeda. Ironically, the latest war funding bill includes $1.4 billion in security and development aid for Pakistan. President Obama approved this $106 billion war spending measure on June 24, 2009, but not all of this taxpayer money is going to our troops. 12% has been allocated to the International Monetary Fund and the swine flu pandemic. It seems as if President Obama is not looking to end the war on terror, but is looking to expand it instead. In light of these facts, it's clear that the president has failed to fulfill the promises to the anti-war base that got him elected. So how do we get him to stay true to his word? 
Movements and organizations full of regular people like you and me are springing up all over the country and mobilizing for peace. People are finally starting to realize that change can begin with concerned citizens taking action. One of the largest worldwide efforts to bring accountability and justice back into politics is We Are Change. We Are Change is an international movement of activists who aren't afraid to ask the tough questions and demand answers the corporate media will not. We Are Change is a grassroots, uh, bottom-up organization that talks about real issues that the mainstream media never even wants to touch or deal with. We are activist journalists going out there asking the hard questions to journalists, uh, corporations, big banks that the mainstream media never even dares to ask, and we get amazing reactions. We put those videos out on the internet, and people get to see true, un, uh, un unedited, real journalism. Code Pink began as a small peace and social justice movement dedicated to ending wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and preventing new wars from starting. They're famous for staging rallies, peaceful protests, and other nonviolent actions in Washington, D.C. and around the world. Code Pink has now truly become a worldwide network of more than 200,000 men and women working together for peace. Locally, the San Diego Coalition for Peace and Justice, San Diego Veterans for Peace, Activist San Diego, and San Diegans for 9-11 Truth are four of the most prominent organizations working for peace and social justice. Furthermore, Meetup.com is one of the greatest tools to reach out to hundreds of people and galvanize like-minded individuals in your community, but you don't have to be part of a group to take action. Leave flyers around your community and talk to your friends and neighbors about these issues. Awareness is essential for lasting change. What else can you do? Don't be afraid to explore outside the world of Democrats and Republicans. Other parties like the Libertarian Party, Constitution Party, and the Green Party serve as viable alternatives to the two-party system. In the last presidential election, Cynthia McKinney, the Green Party candidate, Chuck Baldwin, the Constitution Party candidate, and Ralph Nader, who ran as an independent, united with Republican candidate Ron Paul on four critical principles to end the Iraq War as quickly as possible, quit increasing the national debt, protect civil liberties, and audit the Federal Reserve. For now, Democrats and Republicans have the most sway in government, and some of them do strongly oppose our global war on terrorism. Republican Ron Paul and Democrats Dennis Kucinich and Barbara Lee are a few of the most outspoken advocates of peace in politics today. Representative Lee demonstrated remarkable fortitude when she was the only member of Congress to vote against authorizing military force in the wake of 9-11. We encourage you to research these representatives and find others who consistently advocate responsible foreign policy. If you think one person can't change anything, think again. When Cindy Sheehan lost her son Casey during combat in Iraq in 2004, she channeled her grief through activism. She stepped up as the spokesperson for the anti-war movement and drew national attention in 2005 when she camped out next to President Bush's Crawford Ranch until he agreed to meet with her. Bush didn't meet with her, but the stand inspired a new generation of anti-war activism, and Cindy has been one of the strongest and most steadfast champions of peace ever since. In 2008, she ran against Congressional Leader Nancy Pelosi and received 17% of the votes in the district, and she's not stopping there. What I say in my book that I'm writing right now, Myth America, is that when, before my son was killed, I knew that, that during war people profited. But I thought that profit was a consequence of war. And, and since Casey has been killed, I know now it's a reason for war. Because when you kill innocent people, their families become enemies of the United States, and it's by design. And it's just like the war on poverty or the war on drugs. You know, you can't, you can't ever win these kinds of things, and that's, that's their goal, is to have, a, have war in perpetuity. The more numbers that, that step outside the system and start voting for third party or supporting third party candidates, Hopefully, um, that has some effect in Washington, D.C. However, cities like mine that have citywide ranked voting, we do have Green Party members and, and decline to state people in our city government, but that doesn't extend to state and it doesn't extend to federal, unfortunately. And that's the only way we're going to really get representative, representative uh, democracy. The bottom line is that we must hold our elected officials accountable for their actions. We need to work for peace in this country and around the world. So what are you waiting for? 